<laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Cheers. Okay, so so let's get started. First of all, I just wanted to say thanks to Stephen and the the Data Lab for inviting me to give this this talk today. It's a topic that I'm quite interested in, and it's something that we've been working on quite heavily at Free Agent, uh, you know, for quite a few years now, and in particular over the last couple of years. And there's a bit of a journey there that we've been on in in the wider engineering department that I'm going to be uh, talking about today and basing this talk on. So let's get started. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, what's this talk about today? I mean, I'm as Stephen introduced, I'm going to cover why you might be interested in engineering progression frameworks. I'm going to talk about how we went about creating the current iteration of our progression framework in engineering in free agent. And I'm going to talk about some of the learnings from that process. And I do want to start with a very quick health warning. Um, what worked for us may not work for you. So I'm obviously going to be drawing on my own personal experience at Free Agent, you know, with certain constraints of, of our organization. So, you know, one key message throughout this talk, I think, is that you do need to think about, you know, what the constraints are in your own organization rather than just trying to follow a, a blind recipe that someone might present in a in a talk like this without devaluing my talk too much. <laughs> Um, so in terms of learning objectives for the talk, I know there's a mixture of backgrounds in the audience, um, or at least based on my review of, of attendees before the meeting. And I, I believe, you know, we have a few people from the academic and commercial worlds, maybe some people from management, maybe some people who are individual contributors themselves at present, maybe some people closer to the start of their careers, maybe some people who are quite well established. And I'm hoping that you'll all get something from this talk, whether it's an opportunity to improve or create a progression framework in your organization or to think a bit more actively about your own personal development. So I'm hoping that over the next uh, 30, 35 minutes or so, we'll we'll get into you know what a progression framework is, if it's not a concept that you're familiar with, uh, what some of the reasons why you might want to create one if you don't have one or why you might want to improve one if you have one already and you don't think it's working for you as well as it could. And I'll be talking about some tips based on the experience we had over the last year, uh, last year or two on how to create a, a framework, which is both, both clear and simple and also mo possibly most importantly, fair to, to everyone. Very quickly, uh, what I'm not going to cover, I know this is a, this is a data meetup in principle, but I'm, I'm not going to cover how to do your job, because honestly, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the details of the work that's done in, in all of your organizations is, but hopefully what I'll be able to do is, is guide you through the process and some of the, the thinking behind creating a good progression framework. And I'll show you how that can be a collaborative process and why over-specification can sometimes even be, be problematic. Uh, a quick note that I'm not actually going to be able to show you our specific progression framework at Free Agent because we decided that we wouldn't make that public. Uh, but however, what I will do is show you some examples that I've made up that are indicative of, of some of the principles that I'll be explaining uh, today. And, and last of all, obviously, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's lots of other things that I'm not going to talk about in the talk. But if there's something you'd like to hear me talk about, uh, you know, I, as Stephen said, very happy to take questions at the end. And I'm hoping we could get a little bit of discussion about some of the topics that I'll be speaking about today. So uh, one more bit of context, uh, a little bit about myself. Today at Free Agent, uh, I'm a group manager. I manage two teams, uh, data science and analytics. Free Agent has about 280 people in the organization as a whole. So we're not really a small company and we're not really a, a huge company. We're, we're a sort of medium sized company, you might say. And within engineering itself. So, you know, the the, the sort of um, target for the framework that I'll be talking about in this talk today, we're, we're talking about something used by around 100 people who are individual contributors and then maybe around 20 people who are in management positions. Engineering is the largest single department within Free Agent. Uh, my career at Free Agent, very, very abridged version. I joined in 2013. I was the first data scientist at Free Agent. Back then, there were only about 40 people. So things have things have changed considerably uh, in the last 10 years or so. And before Free Agent, I was a particle physicist. I was working as a postdoc in an experiment called the Compact Muon Solenoid. 
um, or CMS. And that was an organization of around 3000 people. And it, it had its own sort of idiosyncrasies being both large and also uh, an academic collaboration. So a few hints from this. I mean, you know, really, this is a talk about people, although I'm myself a, a technical person. I, you know, I have a technical background and that's influenced how I approached the problem of, of progression framework improvement. And, and maybe throughout the talk, I might, I might convince some of you who may also be in technical roles why thinking about people problems can be can be interesting and, and rewarding and, and also impactful. So let's let's move on to some preliminary concepts. You might have particular definitions of terms like roles and levels and progression in your own organizations um, that are different to what we do at Free Agent here. So I'm just going to give a, you know, a very general definition of some of these terms and a, a bit of an introduction to what a progression framework could look like as a bit of a mental model to have in mind as we're going through the talk. So first of all, roles. And what we're really talking about here, you might call them job families, you might call them the discipline you work in. So examples of roles might be data scientist or software engineer or manager or, you know, marketing or, man or, or you know, sales. You know, there's a, many, you think about the different sorts of, of roles that are done within a company. For example, myself today, I'd consider myself to be a manager. That would be my role at Free Agent. Within roles, most organizations have a concept of levels and you know globally the number of levels isn't fixed it's, it's pretty arbitrary we could we could call them levels like junior mid-level senior some organizations might give them numbers or or letter grades um it'll be generally accepted within an organization that within a role people at a certain level will do certain kinds of work and there'll be some sort of ladder that lets people learn and, and grow and advance from one level to the to the next having these levels it, it lets us hire people into the organization at the right place and then set them up for success in their careers it helps us recognize when people develop their skills and behaviors and it helps us signpost you know where to go with different sorts of problems even you know there might be an expectation for example that senior data scientists provide mentoring for junior data scientists and you know that then these these labels then help you know, junior data scientists know who to go to to find mentoring opportunities, for example. Uh, so let's think about progression very briefly. I mean, progression, it might mean advancement between the levels. So, for example, I've drawn a couple of arrows on the diagram here. It might mean that the junior data scientist has progressed over time. Eventually, they became a senior data scientist by improving their existing skills and learning new ones. And likewise, on the software development role there, we could imagine a, a software developer who started at the mid-level and has advanced to become a senior software engineer similarly by, by learning and growing within their role, you know, which is a great thing to promote staff to, to do in your organization. Another example of, of progression that you might not have thought about would be a more of a sideways move. I mean, for example, a software engineer might decide they want to take up an opportunity in management or, in fact, uh, a manager might decide that they want to return to being an individual contributor. And these, these, these ideas of a dual career track are pretty common in technology companies these days. You know, this idea that, that manager isn't like another level stuck on top of, of individual contributor. They're really different roles, and we want people to be able to focus on a role that works best for them as, as well as the organization. In this example, I haven't drawn an arrow between any specific level, again, because with moves across the way, it'll depend how the expectations, and I'm hinting a little bit about what's coming up, how the expectations for a manager at a certain level might compare with an individual's skills and, and abilities. So that brings us on to the topic of progression frameworks. So I think let's just show a, an example. I've just made something up. Here, this is this is just totally totally indicative. We've got a, a progression framework that contains skills for a junior level, a mid level, and a senior level. And progression frameworks typically break down specific skills into categories. Here, I've just put one row and, and called it skills, but you could obviously imagine multiple rows for for different kinds of of skills. The information isn't always presented in this way uh, as a as a table. 
but I think it's a useful mental model to have in mind. And we can always translate, you know, whatever particular documentation you have into this into this model. And as data people, we're we're pretty used to reshaping data sets. So hopefully this isn't too uh, too unusual uh, an idea. So let's make a, a practical example. This uh, pineapple here. Let's imagine that they're applying for a, a job at our organization and we're, we're interviewing them and we're looking for somebody who can carry out certain kinds of work. So we can use the progression framework to make a judgment based on the candidate's CV and speaking to them in the interviews and any tests that were part of the process to decide what level that candidate should come in at. It can help us decide if we want to make an offer. Is the candidate skilled enough for what we need? Or perhaps more realistically, we might have a couple of candidates that we're considering and the progression framework helps us weigh up those different candidates and decide which one's appropriate for the role and level that we're looking to, to fill. It'll also help us set that candidate up for success once they start, because it, at FreeAgent, we use our framework to make sure we make a fair pay offer to everyone. And it allows us to help that candidate to learn and grow in their role. And I'll come into some of the details how uh, the framework's used uh, later on. Second thing you could do with it, just to, to, to finalize the example, uh, now imagine that the pineapple accepted our job offer and they became a mid-level software engineer, say. Well, now they've been here a little while and they want to advance in their career. So as managers, we can use the progression framework to help uh, the staff member to identify skills or behaviors that they might need to improve if they want to move up to the senior level. So this is how a progression framework might be used in practice to provide some guidance to managers and individuals about what the organization expects as they move up in their in their career. All right, just one more slide on the preliminaries now. Um, a, a few references. If you want to do some more reading about progression frameworks, there's a nice blog post written by Ollie, who was a former CTO and co-founder of FreeAgent, Why Your Business Needs a Progression Framework. Uh, I, if you just Google Google that, you'll, you'll probably find it high up in the results. This talk that I'm giving today is based on a blog post that I wrote based on the, the experience of improving our engineering progression framework. And it's called Five Principles for Writing an Engineering Progression Framework. And again, if you just Google that and my name, you should probably, you should probably find it. I mentioned that we didn't decide to make our own framework public, but there are plenty of examples online of um, engineering progression frameworks. And indeed, for, for other disciplines beyond engineering. And a good source of them is the progression.fyi website. Some great examples that I personally found useful when I was working with progression frameworks were the government digital and data framework, uh, the Monzo progression framework, and the GitLab data job families. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of information out there. Those are just three that I found particularly useful. So let's get into the main part of the talk. Why, why we improved our progression framework, really with the subtitle, you know, why did I, or indeed, why should you care? I mean, obviously, you must care a little bit because you came along to this talk, but I want to try to explain why it is this is important, why it can have a big impact, and, you know, where some areas for improvement might lie. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about the situation uh, in free agent in the engineering department around, you know, the towards the end of 2021. And again, here I've made a, an illustrative example of the sort of progression framework that we had at the time, which I'm going to call example based. Let's imagine we want to create a progression framework. And in fact, I was involved in creating the first engineering progression framework in free agent round about must have been 2016, 2017, as the engineering team was starting to, to grow and subdivide into, into sub teams. You know, I was involved with four or five other managers at that time in doing this task. And it's a natural starting point. Let's think of all the things that a junior engineer might do. And then let's think about all the things that a mid-level engineer might do and, and so on and so forth. And you come up with this big list of examples. And yeah, that's that's not a bad place to start. It's, it, it's, 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 it's a mechanism. It gives you a starting point. When your team's small and all the managers are on the same page about how it works and how it's going to be applied, you know, probably because they created it. That's probably fine. And 
as the team gets bigger, you know, maybe you add new roles, maybe you start having new managers coming in and you, you, you hand them this process. It gets harder to align on exactly what the examples meant when not everyone was in that same room. And a side effect of this can be that examples start to be taken more literally. So suppose there's there's an example there, um, you know, I'm going to come back to this one later, actually, a senior panel member on technical interviews. I mean, perhaps that was only ever intended to be an example of something that senior engineers do. And then suddenly you end up in a situation where people are saying, well, you can't be a senior engineer if you've never been a panel member on a on a technical interview. I mean, somebody might say, well, hey, that was that was just an example. But once you've written it down, people will start to take this stuff literally. And as well, the examples start to age out. You know, a progression framework, it's not like something you can create once and it's true forever because, you know, technology changes and what the business expects will change. So, you know, you do expect a bit of evolution in, in the content. So again, you know, over time, the examples will start to age out if they're just left there on their own. So, you know, in summary, we were getting we were getting quite a bit of feedback from the team, both from individuals and from managers on a few different categories. And it's worth bearing in mind for context, the typical person that this framework was being applied to would be a software engineer working with Ruby on Rails. Although by this time in 2011, we had a lot of different roles uh, within engineering, data science, analytics, Salesforce administration, you know, as well as just that sort of software engineering side. So, you know, individual contributors were saying, well, you know, the, is the applicability clear? There's an example here. I'm, I'm not sure what that means for my precise role. I mean, perhaps it says something about writing code, but I work with Google Analytics and actually I don't write code day to day. So what does that mean for me? Likewise, where it comes to, to leveling up. In the examples-based framework, sometimes that example doesn't carry through from one level to the next. So while senior might say something about being involved in the hiring process, perhaps there's nothing mentioned about that at principal level. So when you come to looking senior to principal level, well, you know, do I need to do anything more about hiring? You know, what, what does that mean? And then finally, opportunity. You know, we found that there were some of the examples, again, that you know, individuals didn't necessarily always have the the agency themselves to be able to go and show. And actually, I'll, I'll not to stick with one, but interviewing is a good example of that. You know, what if we're not hiring at the time? Do I have the opportunity to demonstrate that skill? Maybe not. And likewise, managers had a lot of feedback about the process as well. Similarly to applicability, individuals saying, well, how does this apply to me? Managers were saying, well, how do I translate this? to the individuals, how do I translate this example to the individuals in my team? Now, that's not easy, it makes work for people. And then where it comes to promotions, okay, how do I how do I bound where somebody is? You know, how do I tell, okay, this person, their skill looks more like this than that when I've got this sort of quite, you know, this, 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 you know, set of examples quite that can be quite uh, different from level to level. You know, that can be quite hard to place somebody on the on the scale. And then there's the box ticking. So I mentioned, you know, people taking examples too literally. I mean, you know, one at free agent we've had in the past is might be mentioning, you know, maybe a, a mid level engineer gives a a talk about version control, and you know, suddenly it comes around to review time, and we've got you know five people all wanting to give talks about version control. I mean, you know, well that's that's good, but maybe uh, it wasn't the best use of of everyone's time, and it wasn't the intention of the the framework. You know, box ticking is quite dangerous, and it can lead people to do things and spend time on things that aren't necessarily going to help them actually develop their own skills and and behaviors. And finally, and this is actually a really interesting one, we got a lot of people at Free Agent who are coming from backgrounds like uh, career changers, people who'd, you know, started off in one career, then they decided they wanted to give software development or data science a go. People who've maybe come through boot camps rather than traditional route of doing a degree in a in a university, where some of the examples might have made assumptions about the kind of background somebody came from. So we wanted to see if we could make the framework more applicable to them. Right. Well, hopefully that's that set some of the scene and we'll go on to, you know, how we actually what did we actually do? You know, how did we get from this examples based situation to something that worked a little bit better? And the real key to that was this idea of the, the rope analogy, which I think is attributable to, to Radford. The key idea, can we use this rope analogy to make things simpler for everyone? 
So let's identify a couple of key characteristics about the rope analogy. You can see here, we've got a, a skill involving rope running from levels one through, through six. There's the same number of skills for all levels. So, you know, each level has an entry about rope. You know, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't come back again. It's, it's always there. We can see what somebody knows about rope across the entire spectrum of levels. And it allows us also to focus on knowledge and behavior rather than tasks. So these aren't, these aren't very specific examples. Like it doesn't say like, you know, level four tied five knots and level five tied six knots. You know, it has some description about what those levels know and what their behavior is around working with rope. We started with a little bit of an experiment. So I mentioned, you know, before that I manage uh, two data teams. I was receiving this feedback that, you know, maybe some of the examples in the engineering framework weren't as relevant as they could be to people who work with data. So I set a bit of a challenge to, to one of my teams to go away and, and, and see if they could do better. And, and the challenge involved coming up with a, a rope-like framework to describe their own roles. And of course, at the start, everyone said it'd be easy and it'd only take an hour or two. And, you know, it, it was a, a good a good exercise, if for no other reason than demonstrating that progression framework design is actually a really hard task and it can be very time consuming. But within a few, you know, two or three sessions, we got to we got to an example. And then this gave me something that I could present to the wider engineering department to leadership and say, well, look, you know, maybe we could have a framework like this for data teams. But is the opportunity bigger? You know, could we come up with something that actually worked for everybody across engineering? And that's what we decided to do. So the process we went through to create this engineering wide progression framework, I'm going to call it the bottom up approach, because basically we decided we were going to start completely afresh. And the way we did this, we wanted to involve individual contributors in the process. We wanted to bring people along on this journey of creating this progression framework. So we actually asked for what we, we did, well, asked for volunteers, plus probably volunteered a few people who we thought would be good at this task. And we split them up into three groups. And each group was convened by a member of the analytics team who'd already done a bit of thinking about uh, this type of exercise in the experiment I mentioned when we were talking about the previous slide. And we tasked these groups with a bit of brainstorming task to come up with what they thought skills were that were needed, you know, for their roles in engineering. And they did that using the Jamboard tool. Unfortunately, Google are retiring Jamboard this year, but uh, that's a that's a bit of an aside. It's quite a useful it was quite a useful tool for doing a sort of digital uh, whiteboarding session. We did three of those. Then uh, myself and a couple of the other managers got together and we did a combination phase where we sort of looked at the jam boards and we grouped the skills together and we dropped them into a spreadsheet in the format that I've shown you already that 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 columns for levels and rows for skills format and then we went through several rounds of of polishing that and refining the wording then what we did I think it was really important is we we showed this to everybody in the, the department. You know, we, we circulated this around the managers first and then we circulated it around individual contributors. And we asked for feedback. We said, look, we've come up with this thing now. What do you think about it? Does it sound like it describes your roles? This was great because we got lots of useful feedback. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when I come into the, the principles. Once we had that and we were able to take into account the feedback and respond to people's questions. Sometimes it meant making adjustments. Sometimes it meant going back to people and saying, well, you know, is good feedback, but here's the reason why we can't incorporate that. So it's a mixture of some changes made, some changes rejected, like any review process, really. And then we launched the framework and we did that well in advance of the next time it would be used to review people's progress because we wanted to be really clear with people about what expectations they're working towards. And again, I think that's really important. You don't want to just dump a new framework like this on people, you know, today and then say, oh, by the way, you know, we've graded you all against progress in this new framework. Now, here's your here's your result. You know, that wouldn't be very a very nice thing to do. So you should avoid that if you can. Overall, this process, it took about a year and not to say we were working on this purely over that time. And if we'd done it in a more condensed fashion, we, we could have done it faster, but it was bubbling along in the background over the course of most of 2022. And we used it for the first time in spring 2023. One 
further comment, a slightly smaller exercise that we did. There's less managers, fewer managers than uh, individual contributors. So we also looked at the framework for management as a separate framework for individual contribution and management. And we did that, what I'm going to call the top down approach, where we actually just started from the existing examples and we regrouped and, and refined them into a more rope-like framework. And we, we actually did this on paper by printing out the existing frameworks, cutting them up with scissors and then sort of uh, masking, taping them down onto a big bit of paper until we were happy with it, which was kind of fun exercise to, to, to do something in the, in the real world rather than on a computer. Uh, we then went to the managers, asked for feedback again, you know, went through a similar process of feedback refinement and then launched the process as well for, for spring 2023. I'll talk a little bit at the very end about the pros and cons of those two, two possible approaches. So now moving on to the next section, hopefully this is the most actionable part of the talk. I'm going to do a bit of reflection on the blog post that I wrote and talk about five core principles that uh, I was able to identify from going through the process of designing the progression framework and uh, making the improvements. So first one, principle one, and hope, I think this is the most important principle. The others, are they're not really in any particular order, but I think this one's definitely number one. Do the diagnosis before you start trying to solve the problem. I think that's really important. Make sure you agree with everyone and you understand what the progression framework's for and what you want it to be able to do. So that's going to make things much easier later once you start actually doing the, doing the work. For us, this meant something that we could use to evaluate people's performance. So we have a scoring mechanism. We have a numerical scale. So within a, a band, say mid-level, we give everyone a score against each skill. The score uh, runs from one to four and each score, it's kind of categorical. So on that scale, three means delivering and four means excelling and two means developing. And we, you know, we set that, that numerical point score. And then that translates into a, a process to evaluate someone's position in the salary band across all of their skills, which ultimately is used to fairly assign salaries based on people's position in the band. We also use the framework for personal development. So managers will use the progression framework to identify areas where their team need to grow and develop their skills. And we also use it, as I've alluded to earlier, for hiring when we're trying to evaluate where a candidate might be against our expectations, whether we want to hire them or not, whether we make them a mid-level or a senior or so on and so forth. It's also worth checking if there's any particular requirements from your people or HR team before you get started, because this might be something, I mean, we have a certain degree of agency to control this framework within engineering, within free agent. You know, there are some characteristics of it that are controlled by our people team. So it was very important to involve them in the process uh, as well and not just turn up with something only to be told you, you can't use it later on, which would be would have been a shame. Uh, second principle, I think this one's, there's a, there's a bit of a theme between this and the, the third one that I'll introduce, which is kind of about factorization of information. What I'm talking about here is leaving the implementation details in the role profile and avoiding over specification. And I think if we go back to the original example where I said at the start, when we started working with new progression framework at Free Agent quite a long time ago now, it was created by all the managers by trying to think about all of the different things that people would do at different levels. And the problem with that is, in a way, it's 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 over specifying. It's over specifying the job. I mentioned at the start of the talk that I'm not going to tell anyone here, you know, what specific things to put in their progression framework, because I don't know how to do those jobs. What we need to think about is how to delegate the detail down to the right level. It's quite common for organizations to have role profiles and they might describe what a specific role or level combination is expected to do day to day or over the course of a year. So, for example, there might be a role profile for a junior data scientist and a mid-level data scientist and a senior data scientist. And, you know, it's a lot of documentation. And if you glued all of those together into a big table, you know, you could you could maybe construct that that shape of a progression framework. But then when you looked at it and you took a step back and looked at that big bit of paper, it would contain probably lots of redundant information. So how do we reduce that? And I, I think it's a key idea that I came into this thinking about is, okay, how do we factorize this in a way 
that means we have to write as little as possible. It's writing as little as possible is obviously the, the ideal, right? Less to maintain. And the way we settled on to do that was to, to expect the progression framework describes how behaviors change and the role profile describes the job, the specific job responsibilities. So for example, I've made a, you know, an, an example here with two orthogonal axes. We've got behaviors where, you know, towards the beginning, somebody's more supported in their role, whereas later on in their career, they take more of a leading role, providing more support back to the team. And then we've got some specific job responsibilities like writing code and testing code. But we don't need to specify writing code and testing code in the progression framework at all. We can leave those to the role profile. So let's make an example. Let's imagine we've got two different engineers, Alice and, and Bob. Um, now we can we can put them each in a place in this space. For example, Bob uh, is is earlier in in his career. He needs more support on programming and testing, whereas Alice is already starting to show leadership in programming, uh, but needs further development in testing if she wants to get you know say up from the mid level up to the the senior level. All what all this means is. Delegating those details down to the, the role profile makes it much easier. Now, the, those details, they're not in a global framework that applies to everybody. We don't need feedback from so many people if, if we want to make a change to, you know, maybe the team doesn't need to do testing anymore, or maybe the team doesn't need to do programming anymore. OK, a team can worry about that in their own specific role profile, which applies across all levels, but for their own specific roles and updates can be delegated. So it means we've got less documentation to maintain overall. It means... The progression framework itself goes stale slower. I mean, I mentioned that there's those specific examples that can age out over time. If we move them into a smaller scoped down document, then, you know, progression frameworks more likely to stay current, which is desirable. And the role profiles themselves are easier to update because they don't concern so many people. So the third principle, carrying on this idea a, a little bit of, of simplification and factorization, Include the fewest independent skills and behaviors possible. I think, you know, this is this is really key. What you may discover when you look at your progression framework is that there are various different skills in there that are actually quite similar to each other in practice. And how you might spot that would be if you get to looking at people against the framework, at a sort of annual review, say, and you find people are, are citing particular bit of evidence like, oh, I don't know, I gave a talk at this meeting, therefore I'm excelling at, you know, skill one, two, three, five, seven, 11, 12, you know, and so on and so forth. That might be evidence that those skills are actually not really adding any information to the framework. And obviously, as we know, as, as technical people, deleting code is, is the best. So, you know, there's a, this is, this can be an enjoyable task. Can we simplify the, the, the framework by, uh, using a, a simpler, more orthogonal set of, of skills. And in this example here, a pretty arbitrary one. Again, I've got beginner through advanced and we've got writing code, we've got code review, and we've got giving technical feedback as examples. And let's put Alice and Bob on the scale there again. And we can see perhaps that uh, both Bob and Alice score rather similarly on code review and giving technical feedback, although they do differently both from each other and from their other uh, behaviors on the writing code axis. So we might ask, you know, is there some redundancy there? Can we get rid of something? Perhaps we can. Perhaps we can just get rid of that that middle code review step and say, do you know what? Code review is just giving technical feedback. So we've removed a bit of specification from the framework. You might say, well, wait a minute, that's that's bad. I don't want to do that. But actually, if you think about it, what's the real job of a manager working with an individual is to have a meaningful conversation about development with that person. What do these skills mean for them? What sort of things might they like to do? In this way, we can get rid of the box ticking and we can let the managers do their real job, not just following a process that any old sort of robot could do, you know, actually working with individuals to help them learn and develop and think about what the framework means for them. Uh, principle four, another really, really important one. You want to use simple, accessible and inclusive language and, and language can be really um, can be really critical the way you word things here. I've made a, an illustrative example and I've put a couple of, um, of problematic statements in there. I'm not sure if you, you have an idea. I'll just leave you for 10 seconds to have a, a, a think about what they might be and then I'll I'll reveal what I think they are.
All right, so it's it's quite a contrived example. But when we when we sent our framework for feedback from the wider team, we had a we had a couple of examples in it that were similar, had similar characteristics to the example I've put in here. And the first one we got feedback on was um, the one there is an exemplary writer. Um, you know that could sound that could be unachievable for someone who was a non-native English speaker. You know, could we maybe rephrase that? The other sort of one that that came up you know, would be use of the word expert. Uh, we had somebody, and I'm going to paraphrase the feedback slightly, but we, we had somebody who saw an example with the word expert in and said, you know, to me, a, an, an expert is really knowing everything there is to know about a thing. And, you know, that individual said they discussed it actually with their manager who was male, you know, the person giving feedback was female. Uh, and the, the, the manager had had a different understanding of what expert might mean, that it could refer to... Um, you know, knowing something about a good deal about a, a particular area and being confident enough to to follow up, you know, independently and look at the documentation to solve a problem in an area they were less familiar with, perhaps. So how did we fix those two examples? I mean, we went from is an expert, we got rid of that label, you know, you can get rid of these labels and you can replace them with the behavior. So instead of is an expert, we can have demonstrates expertise. And when you think about something like the writing example, you can look at it and say, well, was being an exemplary writer really what we want? Maybe not. Maybe what we really want is that somebody can communicate well, they can share complex issues clearly and concisely. So again, you know, think about the behavior, not the labels. And the way to identify this sort of thing can be to seek feedback widely, you know, and offer different ways of asking for feedback, speaking to managers, anonymous feedback forms, discussion in meetings or Slack channels. This is something we have really benefited from because there were a few things in those first versions of the framework that we didn't pick up on until we did this. Uh, finally, the fifth principle, ensure opportunity to demonstrate skills. And I've put another couple of troublesome examples here. I mean, the, the hiring one I've mentioned a few times before, you know, obvious. What, what if we're not hiring at the moment? How do I become a senior engineer if we've said you've got to be on a technical interview to be a senior engineer? Another example is the sort of negative example, you know, the incident response. I mean, for, again, for senior here, we've said leads incident response. But what if our software is really reliable and there, there aren't any incidents to respond to? And we obviously want people to to write software which is reliable. So how does it make any sense to require something about incident response to become senior level? Think about the behavior you're really interested in rather than just specific tasks that might demonstrate that behavior. For this, you've really just got to keep asking why and you've got to think positively about what you're doing. You know, Try and turn those, those negatives into, into positives. So here, for example, we might decide that actually the hiring example, it was really about improving the team culture and perhaps, you know, the opportunity to lead certain people processes in terms of risk management. Maybe it's more about risk management than incident response, you know, and maybe what we're really looking for is demonstration of ownership of different kinds of issues and risks. This helps get rid of, you know, it minimizes the risk of box ticking. And it also gives individuals, most importantly, more agency to come up with things themselves to develop their own skills. OK, oh, we've just about made it. A couple of final thoughts. Uh, getting it done. I didn't really talk much about this, but, you know, it's really important with something like this. And it will vary in your own organization. You need to figure out who do you need to get buy in from if you want to make changes to something like a progression framework. Coming up with an example first, having done a little experiment that helped, you know, it's always easier to convince people to do something if you can show them how it could look rather than just saying, oh, let's just do this thing without really any preliminary work. The top down or bottom up thing, again, that really depends by how much buy in from the people the framework's going to apply to that you need, how big your team is, how processes typically work, what morale's like. Getting feedback, super important. Absolutely recommend you take that step. Knowing what to expect, I think you've got to show people changes to a framework well in advance of uh, using it for any people process. Otherwise, people are just going to get upset. And then launching the changes. You don't want to make these changes too often, so you want to get it right. But 
you want to also set expectations that a progression framework is something that changes over time. So this won't be the final answer. To give a brief, brief overview, I mean, our framework that we came up with for both individual contributors and managers, both frameworks involve 15 skills that we identified across five levels with a short one sentence or so description for each one. So not too much documentation to maintain. So summary, hopefully I've taken you through uh, what's a progression framework, why you might want one, and how to create a clear, simple, and, and fair framework. Not maybe the most totally uh, exhaustive list, but hopefully some good pointers in there of what to get started. Did it matter? I think it did matter. I think we've saved managers time by doing this. And we run an annual SWOT exercise in engineering. An analysis of the results for this year showed that progression frameworks had dropped out of the list of weaknesses, which was a big win. I mean, this isn't something that if you get it right, people are necessarily going to be jumping up and down. Yeah, this is brilliant, but they might well stop complaining. So just finally, a few special thanks. Jack, Lee and Lana for their help with the initial skills workshops. Sheila Hughes for her support and suggestions and feedback with uh, Lee and leadership sponsorship of this work. Sheila's head of product engineering at Freeagent. I'd like to thank too many to, to list, but all the staff, all the managers, group managers who contributed to the frameworks for a real team effort over the course of a year and a half. And last but not least, Carly Amos, who kindly did a run through of these slides with me um, a couple of days ago and gave some really good feedback and suggestions on how to improve them. So with that, I'll, I'll stop speaking. Sorry, I think I went a little bit longer than I intended to, but hopefully we've got time for, for any questions there. Thanks very much, Dave. That was, yeah, we've got around 10 minutes left. Uh, that was really interesting. And I guess interesting that for a, a framework for kind of technical teams, it seems that it kind of comes down to clear communication and kind of clearly communicating what's expected of people. Um, so we've got we've got about 10 minutes left uh, if anybody has any questions. If you if you have a question, either feel free to switch your camera on and ask Dave um with the microphone or use the reaction button at the bottom of your screen and just pop your hand up and then we can come to you. Um, just while I give you all a couple of a couple of seconds to kind of think about any questions, I guess just one to get started would be for you, Dave. Um, have you, since you've implemented this, have you noticed any changes in your teams um, since implementing it? For example, do you find that the uh, kind of engineering staff are more focused on progressing their skills? Or is there kind of a change in, in morale, maybe where there's a kind of clearer path for them to progress? Have you noticed any kind of changes in attitudes since it's been introduced? I think that's a great question. As I, as I mentioned in the, the SWOT exercise, that strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, we saw that the progression framework kind of dropped out of the um, out of the, 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 the weaknesses aspect. I think we've got good feedback from the team that the new framework's easier to work with. It's less time consuming. People felt it was more applicable to their roles. So I think I'd almost say it's one of these things that if you, if you make a good framework, it can get out of people's way and give them the guidance to do what they know is what they know is right. It's about giving guidance and shaping direction rather than being an over prescriptive admin process that everybody gets a little bit depressed with a couple of times a year. So I think people are, I think people are happier around this time than they were in the past, both managers who have to use the framework and also individual contributors who are being scored in it. I think it has helped. And I think that journey of getting feedback from the wider team helped individual contributors across engineering feel engaged with the process and um, that they were part of the process, which I think helped definitely helped with with buy into the to, to the framework. Thank you. Um, Fede, I can see you had your hand up there for a second. Do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, this was super interesting. Um, I well, I had three questions that you actually touched already on two of them. Um, but one thing in particular um, I was interested in is uh, how are you approaching um, reviewing the framework? Uh, and in particular, how are you gauging how appropriate there is in terms of uh, the link to your performance evaluation and what that means for actual career progression, for example? Yeah, that's 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 also a good question. I mean, I, I can say that, I mean, I've actually been involved in a statistical analysis with the people team uh, to investigate the rate of progression, both over time 
and uh, also to investigate the possibility of gender bias within the within progression within the framework. I can't comment on any of the the results of that um, publicly, but um, you know I'm 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 happy with the performance of the the framework. So I think the answer is we we, we are conducting statistical analysis actually of the uh, of of individuals' progress within this. Uh, Peter. Sorry, I'm struggling to turn the camera on. <laughs> um, is it in a similar vein, but um, what I was wondering is um, how do you avoid sort of dangers of subjectivity in terms of um, skills? Um, or do you try and deliberately do that? where yeah. you're assessing a, a skill level um if it's i guess if it's poorly defined it can be a subjective um viewpoint yeah i think it's 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 a real it's definitely one of the biggest challenges in how to how any framework is applied i think where you've got a uh, I mean, perhaps outside of some disciplines where you can actually numerically measure it, like, I don't know, say you're talking about sales and it's like, all right, well, you know, did you meet your target for however many, however many quarters, right? That makes it a little bit easier. But in a creative industry like software development, it can be harder to do that. We ask that all the managers provide written evidence for um, to justify their scoring against each skill for every for every individual and that evidence is reviewed um across teams so by the the leadership um team to look for okay is what somebody over here has justified meet meets a you know a three for this skill the same as what somebody has justified as meeting a a, a three for for that skill and there's a, there's actually an hbr article on why um calibration meetings can, can introduce their own set of biases which i'd encourage anybody to, to read i can't remember the title of it but if you just google probably hbr calibration uh, meeting bias you'll you'll find it but i think you know having that written and pre-scored evidence presented up front can help to mitigate the biases of, of calibration meetings but you know we do do a, a a cross calibration and a comparison of how individual managers are are um, interpreting the framework Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Right, thank you. Um, we've still got another five minutes if anybody has any other questions. Um, I will ask another one. Oh, we've got something in the chat. Oh, there's that, that's a link to the, the article there, I think, Dave, in the chat there. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, that's the one. So just in case anybody's having a think for a question, I guess, as you mentioned at the beginning, there might be people here who are individual contributors themselves. Uh, yeah. So I wondered if you have any tips for people who are maybe in an organization that are maybe feeling frustrated or there's a lack of kind of clear progression framework within the organization. Have you got any tips for them on how they can um, maybe influence the management to kind of to either improve the framework they've got or or kind of build one from scratch? I think I think that's a tricky one if you're in a position of um, of an individual contributor. I mean, as I said, in, in free agent, you know, management kind of responded to feedback from individual contributors that the progression framework wasn't always working as well as it could. Um, you know, we have various mechanisms within the company. Our people team run uh, employee surveys a couple of times a year, and we have this strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats within um, engineering. So if you have those sort of things in your organization, you know, feeding up that you'd like more clarity on how to, to progress is is good feedback to give. And likewise, you can give that feedback in your one-to-ones with your, your own manager, assuming that you, you have them. Um, I think you go on a journey with this, right? And I mean, there, there were times in the past where free agent didn't have so much of a of a progression framework we went to one created largely in isolation by the managers and then we went to where we are today with one that was more of a collaborative effort between management and and individual contributors so i don't think there's any reason why you know as an as an ic you can't if you don't have a framework or you don't think there's clarity you can't just make you know do a little bit of the work make make a suggestion rather than just 
you know, doing the usual thing of having a bit of a gripe about it. If you can see something where you think there's clarity, and you, I, I said at the start of my talk, I'm not going to say how to do anyone's job, right? The ones who know the best how to do the job are probably the ones who are who are doing it. So if you're in the position of the one doing a job and you think is not totally clear, then you see if you can make a suggestion about what's missing. That That would be you know, and, and management will generally take that uh, constructive suggestions coming with a solution rather than a, than a problem uh, uh, favorably. That, that would be my, <laughs> I think my number one advice. Right, thank you. Uh, and we've got we've got two minutes left, and we've just had a hand pop up there. So if we go to Fiona for probably the last question, that'd be great. Hello, hi, Dave. Thanks for the talk. Really enjoyed it. Not surprised that you tried to use uh, factorization to solve the problem. It has you seemed to run in themes of that. No, definitely not. Um, I was wondering if when you're building the framework, if you then, if you started, I suppose, within the framework that you already had, so did you end up with the same distinct levels that you had, you know, during your mid-senior, or did you find yourself kind of having to maybe collapse down different levels or introduce new levels? And if you did do that, how I suppose that was then communicated across mm -hmm. the business? So I mentioned that at the start of the talk that there might be some... Uh, there might be some aspects that are like hard requirements by the HR team. Um, and for us, you know, in effect, the, the levels themselves were, were, were pretty fixed. You know, we weren't really, it wasn't really in scope to be uh, changing the levels. Although that said, in the past at Free Agent, you know, we have had different numbers of levels and we have changed them. And that's generally come about where, you know, from a, a process of saying, well, if you've got salary band to say, perhaps you've got a salary band that's very big and you look at it and if you've got expectations for that band and you've got expectations for the band above or the band below and they're very different and you look at it and you say, well, do you know what? It's going to take someone 10 years to get from A to B. Then I think that's feedback that you'd need to take to your to your leadership or HR team and say, you know, is this something we could do? Because people aren't going to see meaningful progress for, you know, for a very long time. There was a point, it must have been around oh, maybe maybe 2018, 2017, maybe, where we split senior into what we called at the time senior one and senior two. And then later on, we called it senior and staff. So, you know, splitting, it, it is something you can do. But here it was it was out of scope. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Um, we have got to the end of, of our time today. So just want to thank you again um, for, for coming to speak to us. If anybody has any questions or they'd like to follow up, can they get in touch with you on, on LinkedIn, maybe? Yeah, or absolutely. Through the, through happy, the to community. happy for anyone to connect on, on LinkedIn and happy to chat more about any of the topics here. I mean, obviously, we've got limited time, so happy to take that offline. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And for anybody who is maybe not a member at the moment, um, this has been a Data Lab community event. So if you aren't a member and you'd be interested in joining, uh, just head to community.thedatalab.com and uh, you can join for free. Uh, thanks again to everybody for joining and see you next time. Thanks everyone for having me.